on behalf of Cambridge Health Tech Institute's Global Web Symposia Series and our sponsor, NanoTemper, I'd like to welcome you to Practical Strategies for Overcoming Challenges in the Development of AAV Vectors for Gene Therapy. My name is Elizabeth Lamb, and I'm the Technical Director for today's event. Now I would like to introduce our moderator for today's webinar. She is Patricia Piatti, Ph.D., Senior Manager, Product Marketing at Nanotempered Technologies. Welcome, Dr. Piatti. The webinar is yours. Thanks, Elizabeth, and welcome, everyone, to today's webinar on practical strategies for overcoming challenges in the development of AAV vectors for gene therapy. Today, we're going to hear from researchers both at Sangamo and Sanofi, and they will share how they navigate the often bumpy road that leads to the development and manufacturing of AAV vectors. First, we're going to hear from Dr. Santosh Katwani. He's an Associate Director of Analytical Development at Sangamo Therapeutics, where he oversees the analytical development of early and late phase viral vectors. Santosh will tell us about how he approaches the analytical characterization of AAV vectors and show us the challenges he often faces from two case studies. After that, we're going to hear from Dr. Xiaoying Jin, a senior principal scientist who has worked at Sanofi for 20 years. She leads a group that specializes in the characterization of AAV vectors and will present how she uses LCMS to characterize AAV capsid proteins, which, as you know, are critical for viral infectivity and vector potency. So without further ado, here's our first presenter, Dr. Katwani. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining. It's, it's a pleasure to be here, and I want to thank the organizers uh, for the invitation. Uh, I represent Analytical Development Group at Sangamon Therapeutics, and I'm going to give you some uh, overall challenges and considerations in characterization of AAB products. Before I go into my talk, I'm going to give a brief overview of Sangamon Therapeutics. Uh, Sangamon Therapeutics is a clinical stage genomic medicine company. Uh, we have uh, four different sites, two in the U.S. and two in Europe. In U.S., we are on either side of the Bay Area. Uh, we, our group, and uh, technical operations along with GMP facilities are in the Brisbane site. So Sangamo has a wide variety of uh, uh, clinical and non-clinical candidates. So these are shown in here. Um, we are also uh, we, we have some candidates that are wholly owned by Sangamo, and we also have partnership with uh, different companies such as Sanofi, Pfizer, and Biogen. We have a few candidates in the phase one, two uh, state as well as we have one candidate partnership with Pfizer in phase three for Hemophilia A. We work on several different technologies, uh, such as gene therapy, cell therapy, and genome engineering, and we use viral vectors for achieving those. So this is the outline of my talk. Uh, I'm going to give you a brief overview of some of the gene therapy viral vectors that are used in the industry. Uh, we'll focus on AAV as one of the candidates for, for gene therapy viral vector delivery, some overview and challenges. And these challenges will include some of the product and impurity characterization, We'll follow up with uh, some of the critical quality attributes uh, and then how do we characterize them. And I'll use an example of two case studies, uh, one with the vector genome title and as well as empty full capsule. These are one of the two, a couple of two uh, uh, critical quality attributes are highly contested nowadays. So I'll give a, a case study on each of them with some data. And I'll conclude my talk with summary and challenges that are, are still ongoing. There are several viral vectors that are used in the industry, and, and these are some of them are shown here, uh, retrovirus, lentivirus, HSV, and AAV, and adenovirus. These differ based on either they are enveloped or non-enveloped, and they can also encompass different types of genetic material, either RNA or DNA, which could be single-stranded or double-stranded. Due to the size of the virus, uh, the packaging capacity can be widely different. It can be as low as less than 5 kb versus it can be as high as 150 kilo bases with HSV virus. And the tissue tropism uh, can be widely different, uh, again, depending on the, the virus, and the inflammatory potential also can be very different. So we're going to uh, focus on AAV as uh, our uh, candidate. 
So what's AAV? AAV is a small 25 nanometer uh, approximately sized non-enveloped virus. It encompasses a linear single-strand DNA with a genomic size of approximately 4.7 kilobases, which is encapsulated within a viral protein capsid. On the right side, I'm showing a cartoon which shows icosahedral geometry of a capsid and genomic DNA. Uh, the DNA consists of an ITR region followed by a promoter, intron, and target gene of interest and followed by a poly A tail in, in second ITR. The genomic DNA is encapsulated in a protein capsid. The capsid can consist of three different viral proteins. These are called at VP1, 2, 3. They could be approximate a ratio of 1 to 1 to 10. And as I mentioned earlier, tissue tropism can be widely different and is generally serotype specific. Currently, there are two approved products in the U.S. Uh, one is Luxterna from Spark Therapeutics, which use AAV2 serotype, and second one is Jolgensma from Avexis, which use AAV9 serotype for SMA uh, treatment. On the right side, I'm showing a graph from a publication uh, which shows the clinical trials have increased uh, in the last few years, both in academic and industrial environment. And many of those clinical trials are at phase one, two stage, um, but there are certain, there are some um, trials at phase three stage as well. Comparing to different serotypes, uh, we still see the AAV2 serotype dominating the field, uh, but uh, it's followed by AV8 and AV9 very closely. And when we compare the different types of promoters, uh, tissue-specific promoters are, again, uh, more common in, uh, in, recent, in recent times. So what are the different challenges of using an AAV while vectors for uh, clinical and technical development? Uh, they can be thought of in four different buckets, uh, AAV engineering, manufacturing of the product, uh, product configuration, and analytical challenges. When we think of AAV engineering challenges, it could mean that we, we, are, uh, we have to look for improved AAV variants and hybrid or novel serotypes to improve packaging efficiency or tissue and target specificity. Once the candidate is found, then we have to think about how can we make the product at a scale. Uh, so there are certain challenges we have to think about. Uh, the yield of the product, uh, as we know, uh, as, as compared to uh, other biologics, the, the yield of the product is still low. Uh, for AAV vectors. So how do we improve that? How do we characterize the process with respect to a product as well as impurity clearance? And how do we consistently make the product? And also how do we plan the capacity if we have to uh, continuously manufacture the product? And once once we figure out those uh, challenges, there is a challenge with the product configuration. What are the formulation excipients that are to be used for the product as well as the stability of the product over long term? And how do we configure the product in, in terms of vials or bags uh, or and how about the routes of administration? So these are challenges are also uh, being faced nowadays. And analytical challenges are all also uh, we have to think about in terms of developing platform methods. For a company with a wide portfolio, you have to start thinking about how do you develop a platform method that you can apply to multiple products. And since we are in still a new field, we have to think about novel analytics. How do we characterize these products and uh, new attributes? How do we characterize the product for uh, extended characterization? Along with the comparability of the product, when you go through clinical development, you have to show comparability of the product at different stages of the life cycle. And also evolving regulatory guidance, you have to keep in mind and when you develop these analytical approaches. Here is a typical list of uh, a summary of analytical assets that I use for uh, releasing at AAV products. This can be uh, bucketed into quality, safety, identity, purity, impurities, and strength. I've highlighted a couple of uh, attributes here, which we will talk about in case studies. And many of these attributes can contain uh, the compendial assays, uh, safety assays, and the remaining are mostly analytical and bi biological assays. Uh, some, they can be product specific or they can be platform specific also. So what are the challenges that are, being, uh, that are being faced by the industry now? So it, I, uh, I've divided them into a product specific challenges. Uh, uh, when you talk about product, uh, you're thinking about genomic DNA as well as capsid characterization. To understand the genomic DNA, uh, we have to develop a precise, fast genomic titer assays to, uh, because these are used as dose determination assays. How do we understand genomic integrity? And if there are modifications in the DNA, do we have to, do we have to understand that as well? What are the different size of uh, DNA that are encapsulated in the virus? What is the size and distribution and identification of those? Looking at the capsid, 
what is the identity of the capsid and can we identify the distribution of different capsid variants such as empty, partial, full capsids. And thinking about capsid, different serotypes can have a different infectivity and transduction, so how do we characterize that as well? Uh, what is the ratio of viral proteins and their post transition modifications? And if there are any aggregates or there are secondary tertiary structures in the protein capsid, we have to understand that as well. The second type of challenge we are facing is the impurity characterization. When you develop a product, you also have to understand the impurity clearance. Uh, so uh, that can be broadly understood into three different domains, uh, process-related impurities, host cell impurities, and the product-related impurities. And some of those are shown here with uh, the, the, the type of assay that I used to measure them. For process, uh, the process can use different types of excipients or detergents that you have to develop uh, new assays for each of those. And host cell impurities typically can contain host cell DNA, host cell protein, and in, in case of uh, baculovirus infectors, uh, uh, SF9 system, you would also think about baculovirus DNA and protein as uh, one of the impurities that you have to account for. And for product-related impurities, you have to think about empty capsid, partial capsids, uh, aggregates, and, and, and in similar lines, you have to characterize those as impurities. So as I mentioned earlier, we'll talk about a couple of case studies, and I've chosen a couple of case studies which are more common nowadays. Um, and uh, one of them is the vector genome titer assay. Um, it's, it's, it's used as a dose determination assay, so there's a lot more scrutiny around that assay. So in, in early stages, it's possible to use, and it's quite common to use the qPCR-based assay. It's high throughput, uh, but it can also carry high variation. And typically, at a later stage, there's a requirement or there's expectation that you have to improve the assay variance, either by improving the assay or using a different platform. And one of the platforms commonly used nowadays is a digital PCR, for example, DDPCR, and that has been shown to, to, uh, to give a robust uh, assay performances. And the expectation would be at this stage to have a precision of uh, less than 15% variance. And once you make a switch, you have to show that you can bridge two assays and understand what it means in terms of the type of the product. So here's some data which, we have, which has been collected at Sangamo and we have we have shown that we can switch from a highly variable qPCR assay which had about 24% variation to a DDPCR assay which has less than 10% variation. And this which has allowed us to better understand the dose uh, in the product and it can also help us understand the dose difference between the different um, clinical candidates. So once we make a switch from qPCR to DDPCR, we have to show that what, what this means for different products in terms of correlating those two methods. Uh, we have used it to uh, different types of correlation methods, either linear correlation or bland ultimate plots. In, in this graph, I'm showing uh, um, DDPCR versus qPCR uh, over uh, 20 different samples. These were uh, for 12 different lots and with different in-process samples as well. And this correlation shows that both assays correlate very well with a very high I square. And in the bland ultimate plots, we've shown the ratio of the titers versus average of the titer graph gives us a bias of around 1.8. What this means is that the, the assay have a bias of about 1.8. So you you better understand what the new assay uh, title would be in, in that in that case. So what's the take-home message from this slide is that we have been able to switch from a highly variable qPCR assay to more robust and more precise DDPCR assay at late phase. And we also have evaluated the, the bridging between two different assays and what it means for continuity of the manufacturing. So second st uh, case study involves uh, uh, looking at the impurity, and one of the impurities as, uh, as commonly uh, studied nowadays, empty, partial, and full capsids. So there's a lot more scrutiny nowadays on what is the, uh, what is the uh, uh, concentration of these uh, partial and empty capsids in your product. Uh, in the manufacturing, you could potentially make different types of capsids. Uh, it could be empty, full capsid, and there could be partials as well as non-target DNA-containing capsids. There are several methods that have been used in the past, um, and those early methods were based on UV uh, as well as capsid to VG ratio. However, in recent times, we have moved to more characterization methods such as mass photometry and child detection mass spectrometry. And AUC and TEM are commonly used as a gold standards for uh, releasing an AAV products. 
However, some of these methods are not amenable for QC uh, environment and methods like NN exchange, HPLC, and uh, capillary electrophoresis with isoelectric focusing are gaining more traction uh, to be used for high throughput as well as QC amenability. So I'm showing a couple of recent papers that there are many publications on use of HPLC uh, for purification of uh, empty full capsules. Uh, the recent two publications on analytical separations are shown here. And the authors were able to show using a gradient system, you can have potentially a separation of empty and full capsules during an chromatographic separation. And by getting the area under the peak, you can, um, you can calculate the percentage of each peak in the distribution. However, as you say that the, 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 there's a partial overlap between the peaks, there could be potential inaccuracies in the quantitation. SciEx also has uh, recently published a paper uh, where they have used the capillary electrophoresis with the isoelectric focusing, and they have shown that they can uh, find the distribution of empty full captures and even some partial captures. Uh, again, the resolution in this technique is still very low, uh, and then one of the reasons is because the, all these captured variants have a very, diff very small difference in the charge distribution. That makes it very difficult to identify and separate them completely. And as I mentioned, we recently mass spectrometry methods like mass photometry and CDMS have been uh, in, in use. Uh, and these are getting more and more traction nowadays. So at Sangamo, we have uh, we have shown an improvement of an exchange HPLC method where we have fully separated empty and full capsules and and, and during an HPLC uh, uh, chromatography. We've shown the resolution we can achieve is uh, much higher than shown previously. Uh, it's amenable to QC validation exercise. And this graph shows a, a mixture of uh, uh, fully empty and fully uh, uh, full vector and the, the mixture of uh, those two samples can be easily separated by HPLC chromatography. And we have uh, we have uh, compared these results with uh, other orthogonal techniques such as cryo TEM and AUC. For example, this graph AUC shows a mostly empty but can be characterized either by HPLC or in AUC as well as by TEM and we've gotten consistent results. We have a, a manuscript in review so hopefully the audience will be able to read it at the, once it's, it's accepted and published. So in summary, hopefully I've given you some uh, some overall challenges that are being faced by the industry and more specifically for analytical methods uh, because these are key to process and product characterization. And there's still a need to improve the current methods and develop a novel method for robust understanding and, and of the product and processes. We also need more user-friendly method and, and especially those which are high throughput for faster characterization. I didn't... Uh, uh, went into uh, detail of extended product characterization. Um, there's a need to understand the product more in detail. Uh, for example, partial AV capsules, we don't know enough about the partial capsules. Uh, in addition, we also have less idea about package and unpackaged DNA on the product. So we have to uh, put more effort into that. Also, uh, th there are a lot of in in non-infectious or defective capsules. And also, we need to understand the VP ratios and their impact on the functional activity. Uh, post functional modifications are getting more traction, and then their impact on functional attributes is being uh, investigated. One of the aspects that I didn't touch upon is the stability of the product. So you had to develop a stability indicating assay panel at early stage of the drug development. So you better understand the, the life cycle of the product and the stability. And as you move through the clinical phase of development, you have to uh, you have to show analytical comparability, and this could be due to the process formulation or method changes. And again, uh, going through the process characterization, you have to develop a new methods uh, if you are using a different types of uh, process excipient. So, and uh, these involve in developing new methods uh, to understand the process. I would like to thank my team for helping me uh, through the presentation as well as my analytical team who is the backbone of this work and some of the former team members are also listed here as well as some collaborators here. With that, I would like to thank you for your time and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thanks, uh, Santosh. Thank you for your talk and uh, a lot of great information uh, and uh, I don't, I'm, think, I'm thinking that everybody's noticing there's a lot that we know about um, the characterization of AAVs, but there's there are a lot of unknowns still. So um, a lot of a lot of work ahead of you 
uh, for sure. So let's go now to our next presenter, Dr. Xiaoyin Jin from Sanofi. The floor is yours. Thank you. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, Patricia, for the introduction. Thank Elizabeth and Nandini for inviting me here. So, um, so I'm in the Sanofi Global CMC Development Genomic Medicine Unit, which is specific for the gene therapy and the cell therapy. And my group is responsible for the characterization, including the biophysical characterization and the mass spec analysis. So today I'm going to focus on the LCMS analysis of AAV capacitor proteins. So here is outline for my talk. First, I want to give you some background about the, the uh, capsid proteins, then talk about some improvement in the LCMS method, and then apply some uh, two applications of LCMS in the AAV, including structure function studies and also in the stable cell lung clone selections. So Santosh already gave a very nice overview on the AAV. Um, AAV. So right now, uh, here I only want to emphasize the capsid protein VP123. Um, so all share the originated from single cap gene and all share the CNC terminal and different end terminals. So capsid protein abundance is roughly one to one to ten, and the exact stoichiometry is depend on uh, depends on the manufacturing platforms and conditions. So what are function of the capsid protein? So so AV capsid protein not only protect the therapeutic genes as packaging material, but also directly impact the viral infectivity. So how does the capacity protein impact the viral infectivity and targeting? So first of all, uh, each cell type has unique capacity protein uh, sequence and uh, corresponding targeting receptors and the tissue traps. Second, VP1 internal region contains phospholipase A2 domain, which is very important for endosomal escape and viral infectivity. And VP1 internal region contains three consecutive PDC binding motifs, which are important uh, involved in the nuclear uptake, and also VP1 and VP2 internal regions contain three basic clusters as a nuclear localization signal. So therefore, it is important to monitor the uh, capsid protein structures, uh, sequence, and uh, post-translation modifications to in the gene therapy development and to make sure that the product we have is a consistent and can have consistent structure and uh, the potency. So show here is a gene, uh, um, gene therapy analytical paradigm strategy. So uh, Santash already talked about this. So it's similar to the recombinant protein. Uh, we including the uh, general quality, strength, content, identity, and impurity and safety. So highlighted in the red is uh, are the LCMS applications uh, in the uh, paradigm. So. Use, uh, we use LCMS to confirm the capacity cell identity, and uh, we use LCMS to characterize the uh, capacity protein heterogeneity, and also use the LCMS to identify the host cell protein and the virus proteins. So, um, so here shows this slide shows some challenges the AAV characterization. So, the, especially the AAV usually the the productivity is low and uh, the material is limited. And also the protein concentration is, uh, compared to the recombinant protein, is very low. So typically with 1E13 uh, VEG per mil, the protein concentration is only 50 microgram per mil. And uh, compared to the recombinant protein, is usually started with uh, 15 milligram per mil or 10 milligram per mil. 
And also the AAV has contains a detergent and the detergent will interfere the separation and also the ionization. And the AAVs have the high molecular weight, like 5 megadalton, and it is challenging to characterize the AAV in the native uh, condition for the conformations. And also AAV contains the DNA and the protein. We need to characterize both. And also AAV have a, a different level of hydrogenating. So here this slide shows the two workflows we typically for the LCMS to characterize the capsular proteins. So shown left is the LCMS intake protein, which is this method will provide accurate mass. And based on accurate mass, we can determine the modifications on the protein level. And shown right is the peptide mapping. Uh, so peptide mapping, will, uh, we can obtain the full sequence coverage and also identify the modification site. And uh, if there's minor modifications, we can use LCMSMS to, uh, to identify. Um, so shown left is, uh, is uh, TIC, total ion chromatograms of the viral capsule proteins. Um, uh, uh, three different cell type AV127, and as we can see, the VP1, VP2 can be separated in the VP3, but however, this uh, VP1, VP2 is not completely separated in those, all three cases. And uh, here, the mobile phase we use is formic acid. So we collaborated with Waters. Waters colleague helped us to improve the develop the improve the separation with use of the mob phase using uh, diphenyl acid. And this is the data show is A V five and acquired in the bicode system. And we can see the V P two, V P three, V P one are nicely separated. And in addition, we can observe additional variant. So this improved separation allow us to detect them. Uh, um, individual VBs, especially the minor species. And this improved separation also allow us to quantify the VP through the optical signals. So on the top is the UV and the bottom is the fluorescence. And with 0.05 micron on color injection, we can get a 20-fold improvement in the signal-to-noise uh, ratios. So with the LCMS, we have identified a multiple level of a capsular protein hydrogenated, and those capsular protein hydrogenated might impact the transgene expression. So we 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 can um, so first the hydrogenated is a VP expression level. So there's a literature report is a low VP1 expression linked to the low uh, transgene expressions. We also identify the intermolar hydrogenated in the VP1, VP3, and we identify multiple uh, modifications, including acetylation, deamidation, and phosphorylation, and so on. So today, I'm going to talk about the structure function study on the deamidation and the acetylation. So why we are interested in deamidations? As I mentioned before, VP1 term region contains a PLA2 domain, which is essential for the endosome escape and the viral infectivity. And if we look at the sequence, the PLA2 from, uh, and this contains a 1NG site, which is conserved across the different AAV cell type. And we wonder whether the N 57 deamidation will impact the uh, viral infectivity. So we also noticed that a different uh, manufacturing platform will impact the deamidation level. So shown um, that here is a TIC of total ion chromatogram of the um, AV1 and the AV2 from platform 1 and the platform 2. So in the both cases, uh, platform 2 produces a slight high deamidation compared to the platform 1. And we also look at the PI ratio, so part, uh, and we notice that platform 2 material have a higher in a PI ratio, which is less potent. So we want to say whether this is a link between the deamidation and the PI infectivity. To further confirm the, um, the link, the deamidation with the uh, potency, we 
collaborate with uh, research our research colleague in Sanofi, and they designed them a uh, side uh, mutant and a mut uh, have a uh, generated high deamination mutant, uh, and then test those mutant um, in both in vitro and in vivo. And here's in vitro data and it's testing three cell lines in all three cell lines for the Y type. We have a nice transgene expression, but in the, in the, in the high deamidation mutants, there's no expression at all. And it is consistent in the in vivo. And similar, we have a nice expression in the retinal tissues, uh, but there's no um, expression. So complete deamination of the AV campus about is the trans transduction in the retina and this could be a, a critical quality attribute and we need to control and monitor. We also look at the acetylation. So for uh, we using the LCMS we identified acetylation in the both in the um, VP1 and terminal and also VP3 and terminal in the multiple cell types. And when we look at the sequence, color, uh, sequence alignment and uh, the, the methionine, the alanine is most conserved and uh, in the most cell type except the AV5 is a follow with a serum. And uh, VP3 is also highly conserved except in a few cell types. So uh, if we look at the, um, the sequence, uh, we, uh, we look at the sequence that if the, based on the literature, uh, if methionine followed by the alanine or serine, the acetylation will be frequency will be high. If the methionine uh, followed by the glycine, leucine, and proline, the acetylation level will be low. So uh, our colleague in the research um, they generate the mutant with a VP1 mutant, a VP1, VP3 mutant, or the double mutant, and it's mutated from the alan uh, to the serine uh, to those three residues in the AV5. So this shown this slide is a VP3 mutant. So compared to the white type, the AV5, and this is a different dose range from high, middle, and low dose. Have us in the high dose, we can see the nice uh, uh, expression. Uh, actually, it's interesting you know, from the if we were mute, uh, muted from the S2G, and we have a, a significant higher uh, increase in gene expression, and uh, even in the low dose um, samples tissues. And in the in contrast, the AV5S194P and the gene uh, expression is reduced. So we are still working on to understand the impact as in the mechanism of acetylation on this uh, gene expression. So this next um, example is the AV stable cell line chrome selection. So in the Sanofi, we have uh, established the stable um, cell PCL process, which is using the HeLa cell line, which includes the transgene, rep gene, cap gene, and the G1 gene, and with the help of virus AD5, we can uh, produce the AV. AV. So uh, clone selection is a critical step in the, uh, the process development to make sure that uh, the uh, final clone has a uh, uh, high productivity, decent doubling time, and the, is the cell can produce the high potency AV factors. So, uh, in one of the program when doing this uh, clone selection, so we notice the final two candidates have the um, two candidates have clone one and the clone two have the potency difference, and also we notice the difference between the early passage and the late passage. So we wonder what the structure cause difference causes the potency difference. We so we characterize the um, AV factors that are generated from those clones. Uh, using the LC fluorescence, CSDS, LCMS, and the LCMS MS peptide mapping. So this slide shows the potency uh, difference between the clone one and the clone left is clone one and the clone uh, compare clone one early passage and compare clone two early passage. So the clone one is uh, Pot, uh, more potent than the clone 2 and is similar to uh, 
to the late passage. So clone one late passage is more potent than clone two late passage. We also notice that uh, with the passage increase the passage, the potency reduced. So clone one early passage is more potent than clone one late, and the clone two early passage is more uh, potent than clone two late passages. So when we look at the VP uh, ratios using the LC fluorescence, um, shown here is the VP123, and we notice the VP2 has a higher um, VP2 in the clone 1 um, material. So this the blue is clone 1, and, and the orange is clone 2. And it's a, uh, similar as the data CSD data shows that in the VP2 of the clone 1 early has a higher uh, VP2. So it is possible that a high uh, VP2 link to the um, potent, high potent in the VP1 early material. We also look at the intact protein analysis, and as this is a shows the phosphorylation, it is interesting that the phosphorylation over the passage is increase the passages, the phosphorylation decrease slightly, and as shown here is this is true for clone one and clone two, both for the VP two and the VP one. Uh, we lo look at the peptide mapping, uh, so. In the, we look at the deamidation, so based on the previous data, the deamidation of this site is critical for the uh, uh, fun, uh, potency. So between the two blue bar, which is the clone one, there's no significant difference, but the, however, in the clone two is the orange, so clone two have a, a higher the, um, deamidation than the, on the uh, late passages and the early passages. And uh, the phosphorylation, so it's a, um, this data, peptide mapping data is consistent with the intact protein analysis. Uh, so it's uh, in the always the uh, late passage has uh, reduced uh, uh, phosphorylation in a different site. So um, is it is possible that the deamidation difference between the uh, clone to the early late might uh, correlate to the potency difference with the early and the late. So here is summary for my talk. First is that the improved LC separation allows quantitation VP percentage by optical uh, detection, and this method can be potentially implemented as a GMP release method to model capsule uh, purity. And this is, uh, I'm sure, this is a manufacturing platform influence the capsule the protein PTNs and also will affect the potency or infectivity. And we observe the structure difference in, in the percent, uh, percentage of VPs and the PTMs in the between clones and the early and the late passage. So here's uh, as a list of people I uh, um, I want to thank thanks to my team the Lin Chi Yin Fan Yin Joe for generating the data and uh, thanks to our cl uh, collaborators in the process development development and the research and also I want to thank uh, our collaborators in, in the Waters College especially Shimo help us to develop the improve uh, the uh, method thank you for your attention. Oh, thanks. Uh, thank you, Xiaoying, for sharing this very insightful data. Um, I personally loved to see some in vivo uh, data as well. Um, it's sometimes rare to see in these presentations, um, actually see the uh, vectors being tested in vivo and getting to see some of those uh, results. So this is the time now. We're moving on to that part of that webinar when uh, you, the audience, gets a chance to get their questions answered. Um, 